Okay, so this is part two of the French Revolution, and as you see here, the map we left off with on the last uh, the last presentation, here is what the continental system looked like, or here's what the continental system was supposed to look like. So, as I said, the continental system would be bad decision number one for Napoleon. This thing's going to backfire. Britain did lose trade. But France suffered more because Britain has the strongest navy in the world. Um, the powerful British navy was able to cut off uh, overseas imports to France and uh, the rest of the continent. This weakened the French economy a lot worse. Uh, it did a lot more damage to the French economy than it did the British economy. And as a matter of fact, Britain is going to continue to trade with Russia. So... Haitian independence, basically, uh, it's an independence movement. It goes from 1792 to 1804. The Haitian slaves revolted against the British because of the ideas of freedom and nationalism. Napoleon helped them at first, but then turned against the revolt. So this is going to lead him to fighting a, a war over in the Caribbean. So, in 1812, Napoleon decided to invade Russia. National, the, the, uh, excuse me, Napoleon assembled an army of over 500,000 troops. He's going to do this uh, right after he gets out of, I believe he gets out of Spain. And he lost over 300,000 troops in Spain. So, he gathers up about half a million more troops. And um, they're not all French soldiers. He's having to gather them from all over his European empire. So they're not going to be as loyal. And he led this grand army into Russia. Napoleon planned to defeat the Russians in a quick, decisive battle. Uh, to his surprise, the Russians refused to stand and, and fight. Instead, they retreated. However, what they did was is they burned everything that they left behind. So in other words, they burned their crops, they burned their houses as they went, they burned their their animals, their livestock, everything's burnt to the ground so Napoleon cannot feed off of the land. This policy is called the scorched earth policy. The Russians will use this again in World War II to help defeat Hitler and, and his invasion of Russia. So they forced Napoleon to uh, lead his army, uh, th or excuse me, they forced Napoleon to lead his army deeper into Russia. And as he goes deeper into Russia, he has no supplies. He has to create a supply line to go back to France to get supplies instead of being able to live and forge off of the land. And it slows his army down. So, uh, Spain, he's going to invade Spain as well. Uh, I talked to you, I think, I think he invades Spain uh, roughly in 1808 to 1813. So he's just getting out of Spain as he enters um, into Russia. Napoleon, his brother, or Napoleon and his brother wanted to make, uh, Napoleon wants to make his brother uh, the king of Spain. So we have yet again in history, Remember, we had Louis XIV wanting to make his grandson the uh, king of Spain. Well, now Napoleon's wanting to make his brother king of Spain. So the Spanish people were revolting for five years. From 1808 to 1813, the peasants rebelled. They fought what was called little, a little war, um, which means guerrilla warfare. Uh, this is where we get the term guerrilla warfare from. The Spanish rebels uh, fought in these small armies. They used hit-and-run tactics. Um, ambush tactics, um, and like I said, guerrilla is Spanish for a little war. So in Spain, uh, they saw Napoleon not as a liberator, but as a as a conqueror. And Napoleon's going to lose over 300,000 troops in this war. And as I said just a minute ago, he loses 300,000 in Spain, and then he immediately, uh, even before he completely gets out of Spain, he's going to raise an army of over half a million to invade Russia. So, as I said, the invasion of Russia is going to be strike number three against Napoleon. Uh, he invades Russia. He invades Russia mainly because uh, the Tsar of Russia, Alexander, will not stop trading grain with uh, the British. 
uh, really, um, and Napoleon had asked Alexander to quit trading grain with the uh, the British, but the Russians don't really have anything going for them. They, they can make vodka, and they make that out of potatoes, and they can sell grain, and that's really all the Russians got going for them. So they need to sell grain to Britain so they can stay in business. So, of course, uh, uh, Alexander refuses to stop trading grain with um, the British. So, in your notes here, the Russians finally engaged the French near Moscow, about 500 miles outside, or nearly 500 miles inside of Russia. So, they wait until Napoleon gets to close outside of Moscow. The Russians start to fight. The French win. But when Napoleon enters Moscow, he found the Russian capital in flames. Napoleon soon realized that he could not feed and house his army in Moscow. And this is in October of 1812. So he's got to order a retreat because there's nowhere for his soldiers to stay. There's nowhere for his soldiers to stay. And it gets uh, cold in Moscow. So during his retreat, it's going to be bitterly cold. It's going to turn to winter. And this is when the uh, this is when the Russians come out and fight. So basically, the Russians are going to fight Napoleon all the way outside, uh, all the way to the outside of the uh, the Russian homeland, the Russian border. And thousands of Napoleon soldiers starve, freeze, or uh, get killed. Uh, so thousands of soldiers die. Just to give you an idea, the Russian army attacked the stragglers, and out of a force of right at 500,000 troops that invaded Russia, fewer than 10,000 returned to France. So he loses right at 490,000 troops. The end for Napoleon. Napoleon's enemies formed coalitions to fight against him called the Grand Alliance. After his first defeat, uh, he was sentenced um, to exile in Elba. But as you see, Elba's um, right below France. It's an island right below France in the Mediterranean. But he soon returned from exile with the help of uh, his, basically with the help of his unconditionals. This period was called the Hundred Days where he comes back. He gets power from Louis the Seventeenth, And Napoleon will reinstate his army. And he ends up having to fight another battle. Uh, the Grand Alliance quickly reforms. And Napoleon's finally, defeat, uh, finally defeated in the Battle of Waterloo in 1815 in Belgium by the League of Absolutist Countries. That would be Austria, uh, Russia, Prussia, Great Britain, the Grand Alliance. They consider, considered by his enemies as a danger, Napoleon was sent in exile again, this time to St. Helena in the Atlantic Ocean um, off the coast of Spain, where he's going to die in 1821. And see here, here is Napoleon's empire. So the organization of Europe after Napoleon. After Napoleon, there was no turning back because feudalism was dying. In, um, in France and some other European countries, the church was losing power. The concept of the state became linked to the concept of a nation. And the bourgeoisie, the middle class, became the most powerful social class in Europe. So, you need to know the Congress of Vienna and the Restoration in 1815 to 1830. If you look, the absolutist monarchs met in uh, Vienna, um, in Vienna, and it's called the uh, called the uh, Vienna uh, Congress, sorry, Congress of Vienna. And as you see, they returned the frontiers of France, uh, where France's borders were in 1789. They restored legitimate monarchs to every European country. They tried to create a balance of power to avoid another revolution. They agreed to intervene in a conflict in any state if the monarch was in danger. So all of these nations, if you look here, all of these nations, they uphold the Christian values of, uh, um, in Europe. Um, they hold, they, you know, European political life, uh, the chancellor, um, of Austria uh, made it, uh, as you see, a bastion against revolution. Uh, so they're trying to 
return Britain back to or excuse me, return Europe back to an absolutist monarchy state. And we have finished up.